Good evening, everyone. I'm Charles Whitaker, Dean of Medill. Thank you for joining us for this, the culminating event in our year-long celebration of the 100th anniversary of the founding of Medill. Since last February, February 8th to be exact, our official founding date, we've hosted a series of centennial events, both virtual and in-person in select cities around the country to celebrate the storied past of this great institution. COVID permitting, we'll have a few more events, perhaps at a city near you, so be on the lookout. But as we wind down the revelry, we thought it was also important to convene some conversations around this important sea change of a moment in the industries we serve. We serve. We're living through a time when news outlets and marketing and communication firms, just like many other institutions, are reckoning with systemic racism and their complicity in promoting and maintaining institutional racism. We began less last fall with a very engaging conversation with Damon Jones, Chief Communications Officer at Procter & Gamble, um, the consumer products behemoth that was pretty universally applauded for the authentic way in which that company promoted diversity in its marketing and customer engagement and its widely lauded response to the killing of George Floyd. Tonight, we turn our attention to journalism and the ways in which news outlets are wrestling with representation within their ranks and in their coverage. We're honored and fortunate to have five dynamic news leaders, including three Medill alums, join us for what I'm sure will be an interesting conversation about the big issues and perhaps the changes that are animating their newsrooms. Before I begin, I just want to take a moment to thank each of our panelists, Melissa Bell, publisher of Vox Media, Kim Godwin, president of ABC News, Kevin Merida, executive editor of the Los Angeles Times, and Matt Murray, editor-in-chief of the Wall Street Journal. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking the time to join us this evening with all that's going on in the world. I know how incredibly busy each of you must be, and we're so appreciative of you taking this time. I also want to thank our moderator for the evening, Emily Ramshaw, co-founder of The 19th, an independent nonprofit newsroom devoted to covering issues at the intersection of gender, politics, and policy. Emily is an award-winning journalist, a Medill alumna, and former editor of the Texas Tribune. She also, I'm very happy to, and honored to say, is a member of the Medill Board of Advisors. Panelists, thank you all for being with us this evening. And Emily, I turn the proceedings over to you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dean Whitaker. Uh, it's a delight to be part of Medill Centennial and a true pleasure to be with all of you tonight. I am so looking forward to a really robust conversation with a bunch of my friends here. So I'm excited to introduce uh, tonight's panelists. Um, we'll start with Melissa Bell, who is a fellow Medill alumna. She's the publisher of Vox Media, the company known for building modern media properties and the platforms that enable them. Uh, Melissa is also the co-founder of Vox, Vox Media's network known for explaining the news. In the last, uh, in the five years since Melissa co-founded Vox, the initial network has grown into a vast empire that spans long form features, a Netflix series, a daily news podcast, and more. Uh, during her tenure at Vox Media, the company was named one of the world's most innovative companies in media by Fast Company, a company of the year by Inc and earned a 100% score on the Human Rights Campaign's Corporate Equality Index for LGBTQ inclusive workplace policies and practices. Kim Godwin is the president of ABC News, uh, where she oversees editorial and business operations for broadcast, digital, streaming, and audio news across the organization, uh, which includes trusted and iconic franchises like Good Morning America, World News Tonight, 2020, Nightline, 538, The View, and This Week. Over the course of her career, Kim has executive produced news programming, managed a nightly news broadcast, created cross-digital content, and earned recognition for award-winning programming and reporting. She also began her career running local newsrooms in markets all across the United States. She's a fierce champion for inclusion and telling representative stories. Um, Kim helped to develop both the CBS News Race and Culture Unit and CBS Village, a multi-platform franchise to highlight content about diverse groups. Just also want to add that in 2020, she was recognized by the National Association of Black Journalists and Medill with the Ida B. Wells Award for her work in advocating for coverage of communities of color. Kevin Merida is the executive editor of the Los Angeles Times, overseeing the newsroom as well as Times Community News and Los Angeles Times en Español. Previously, Kevin was a senior vice president at ESPN and editor-in-chief of The Undefeated, a multimedia platform that explores the intersections of race, sports, and culture. Before ESPN, Kevin worked for 22 years at the Washington Post, where he rose through the ranks to become its managing editor. 
Kevin's honors include being named Journalist of the Year in 2000 by the National Association of Black Journalists. Uh, he received the Missouri Honors Medal for Distinguished Service in Journalism in 2018. He's also received NABJ's Chuck Stone Lifetime Achievement Award in 2020. He serves on the Pulitzer Prize Board. And finally, last but not least, Matt Murray, a Medill alumnus and member of the school's Hall of Achievement, is the editor-in-chief of the Wall Street Journal and Dow Jones Newswires, and is responsible for all global news gathering and editorial operations. Since being named editor in June 2018, Matt appointed the journal's first editor of culture, training, and outreach. He also has developed partnerships with universities serving diverse populations to prepare the business reporters of the future. Matt is the author of two books, The Father and the Son tells the story of his father's spiritual quest and decision to enter a Benedictine monastery after the death of Murray's mother. He's also the co-author of Strong of Heart, Life and Death in the Fire Department of New York, a memoir published in 2002 with former New York City Fire Commissioner Thomas Van Essen, Von Essen uh, that chronicles Von Essen's career in the New York City Fire Department pre and post 9-11. So obviously an esteemed and phenomenal group here. Y'all are very lucky to be with this crew. Um, so the, the question that frames this evening's discussion is, does the news represent us? And I think that gives us really a large canvas to discuss big issues like trust of journalists, bias, equity, hyper-partisanship, and news coverage decisions that we all make every day. Uh, we also now have a Medill poll of more than 1,500 news workers, which was conducted by Professor Stephanie Edgerly that was released earlier this week that I think is going to guide some of our, our conversation tonight. So we'll use some of those survey responses um, within. Okay, so let's dive in and I think we have a couple of slides to kick us off here. Uh, an enormous subject of conversation in my newsroom and I know many of yours is how we build more diverse audiences by starting with building more representative newsrooms. Uh, the new Medill Media Industry Poll of news workers found that less than half were satisfied with diversity, equity and inclusion efforts in their newsrooms. And while they pointed to steps to provide DEI workshops to change hiring procedures to make their newsroom culture more inclusive. They across the board believed that efforts to retain journalists of color were falling short. Um, the same poll found that journalists believed newsrooms hadn't worked to change policies around the language they used to describe protests of racial injustice. And so I just want to kick us off by asking, you know, I'm curious how you all are leading by example here and how you're providing not just lip service, but institutional change. Um, and Kevin, maybe we could start with you this evening. Thanks, Emily. Well, at, at the LA Times, this very issue of, of language, and it, it came up before I got there and, and post um, Floyd era. One of the things that I think we, we have, we have a pretty strong caucus, group of caucuses. We have a, a Latino caucus, we have a Black caucus, uh, an AAPI caucus. They're all very active. I, I consider them leaders in the newsroom. And we went through a process of looking at language, our standards and guidelines. Uh, and took some steps, had a committee, looked at it, um, and, our, and also about to issue some new guidelines and a range of things. So it's, it's one thing we did to be internal. I think we talked a lot about uh, how we share what we do and be more transparent about our internal process with the public, uh, because you get a lot of questions from the public um, and scrutiny. So we want to say, th this is this is our sausage making process and we went through it and this is what we, we did to change. Um, I think the other thing in, in terms of just um, that part of an inclusion, I think is also being more intentional about going to the places where, where people live, meeting them where they are. And, and we started a series uh, of kind of community engagement meetings with different groups around specific issues and, and really so far on Zoom, but we plan to do a lot of that, you know, as, as, as COVID uh, protocols and regulations change can be more of those in person. So those are just a, a couple of things. Thank you. Who wants to jump in next? Melissa? Kim, I saw you unmute. Do you want to go first or I can jump in? Oh, it's okay, yeah. Melissa, go ahead. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I think I think one of the things that um, that I'll just uh, tag on with Kevin, and I feel bad because this is a little bit um, promoting a Vox Media initiative, but it is something that I'm really excited about. One thing that I did that I did see us um, really not just us, but other newsrooms struggle with that didn't have big, robust copy edit desks to be able to have those conversations around language, Kevin, that you're talking about. 
um, was the opportunity to start an industry-wide conversation. Um, we have this incredible editor um, on Vox.com, Tanya Pai, who proposed creating a public uh, style guide. Um, and it's going to be launching next month called Language Please. It's with Google um, uh, funding and Fox Media funding that will allow us to look at words in uh, real time and understand how fast language is changing, um, how much debate there is around what words are appropriate and what words are not. Um, and it's a way for us to actually help provide um, a starting point for the discussions. Um, Kevin, what you described I think is so fantastic for a newsroom um, at the size of LA Times, but a lot of newsrooms can't do that in at, at the speed of what you probably can do. Um, and so one thing that we really want to use is um, as a as a larger company, how do we help the industry um, overall? And We um, we're going to be starting to have that uh, connection to the communities that we want to serve. Um, so look for it next month. It's called Language, Please. Um, but it's very it's 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 uh, dead on on the um, on the type of work that Kevin's talking about. Okay, Kim, jump in there. Sorry to cut you off before. It. I, I will. Um, first, I'll say that I, I'm evidence, right, as the first woman and the first person of color to lead ABC News that's evidence that we are making progress and that the company you know has made progress in that in that way to be the first one in the history is you know it's and it's 2021 or it was 2021 when i was hired it shows something there but i entered uh, abc news in a very authentic way because i believe sometimes we we do have people of color in our newsrooms but they don't really have a voice they're afraid to use that voice. Uh, they're marginalized. Uh, they feel um, uh, like they can't speak up even when they don't think things are going well or about stories that are important to them because they feel shouted down. So it was really important to me to come in and I, I really literally told my story in, in an authentic way from my parents where I grew up, that I went to an HBCU, that experience and how it informed my journalism as I walked through um, my, my journalism career, you know, 10 different cities, all kinds of newsrooms, things that I learned along the way. And that in itself said to a lot of people, and I ended it by saying, so I want you to bring your authentic self to ABC News. Everybody has a seat at the table. And that empowered a lot of people. So when you talk about walking the walk, that was uh, something that I wanted to do right from the beginning. And when I got here, I realized that they had already, um, the Disney Corporation slash ABC had already seated a culture council, um, and, but it was recently, you know, recently gathered. And I empowered that culture council to talk to the organization in any way that they wanted to. Um, and they had all kinds of meetings that there were no managers, um, they organized themselves and to come back with recommendations to the organization as to how we could be more inclusive in inside the organization and outside the organization in our reporting. And frankly, they came back with 17 uh, recommendations. And I took the time to go through all 17 of those recommendations and I addressed every single one, how we were going to address that in some way and in some transparent way. For the first time ever, I put up all of our DEI stats internally and said, here's what we look like right now. And I commit to every quarter showing you this chart so we can see how we're tracking. Are we doing better, worse? Where do we need to, to, uh, to do better? Um, and so, it, you know, when you talk walking the walk, like it really has to be to me a transparent process that the people of the organization feel like they are empowered and included and part of the solution um, constantly. Matt, you want to tackle this one on the journal standpoint? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's a lot of things. I like a lot of what Kim said, and I echo, I think one thing that's important is at the top of the organization, people have to be involved and committed, but also continue to be so. Uh, it's very easy to sort of come out and make a pledge and move on, but I think you've got to always be involved uh, and stay involved. 
you know, look, I think for, I think for us, um, you know, it, it's a holistic kind of set of things. And another thing Kim said was there's internal and there's external, right? So there's thinking about how you're reporting, where you're reporting, what you're writing about, who you're talking to. There's also, by the way, it's not all that. It's even things like thinking about your photos mix and selection or thinking about your illustration mix and selection and trying to be broadly representative in sort of, a, you know, I mean, I mean, in the broadest sense of representative, almost like a democratic way consciously over time and not sort of tilt one way or the other in anything. And then internally there's, you know, um, uh, we have a fellowship that we've encouraged to allow different people to come into the heart of the newsroom, work with us, make recommendations that we embrace on how to improve our processes, how to improve our inclusivity. We've laid down rules on hiring that, you know, we don't hire people unless we know that uh, candidates of color and women have been interviewed in the candidate pool and that they are doing outreach. We, uh, you mentioned the programs that we did with, uh, we started with Morgan State University in Baltimore and we've added Lehman College, which are fellowships where we work closely with the universities and our journalists will go involved, uh, be involved and work with folks to sort of help on the front end. And I think, I don't think it works unless there's a holistic approach. You know, I think if you went to a lot of organizations, you would say, for instance, recruiting has really improved, but retention is a challenge, or we're great at this level, but we don't have enough managers at this level. It's gotta be a holistic thing and it's gotta be ongoing. And you know, that, that's, that's my, uh, we can talk more about it, but that's a few quick thoughts. Thank you. Uh, Kim, we'll start with you on this next one. How, how do you all think about the notion of objectivity, which for some is still sort of the holy grail in American journalism and for others sort of always has been a myth. I mean, when you look at journalists who have been told not to tweet certain things or who've been told not to show up at Black Lives Matter protests, who've been told they can't cover hate crimes against AAPI people if they're part of the AAPI community or can't cover sexual assault if they're a victim of sexual assault. Are we operating under archaic rules that need to evolve or has has the pendulum swung too far in the other direction? Look, I think that I wouldn't say archaic rules that need to evolve, but but our thinking on this has evolved to, to some extent, right? Um, or at least mine has uh, to some extent. I don't believe that we should be marching and protesting and you know that kind of thing as journalists. I'm just one of those people, a capital J in that regard. Um, however, shared life experiences to me help inform our journalism, right? So um, if it is disclosed and part of your reporting and part of how you can provide insight or questions uh, because you are a victim of sexual assault and therefore, you know, the story that you're doing is, is one that you are going to disclose, uh, you know, in some way that might inform our audience in a unique way, I think that's okay. Um, same way, you know, it's ridiculous to think that an Asian American person can't go and cover AAPI crimes or black people can't do that. Like the journalism should come first, but as a journalist, we do have to, um, I think, pay more attention and allow people to, to bring their life experience to the journalism. Um, and it informs the questions. It doesn't mean that you won't be objective or fair. That's why we also have editors and people, producers and others who look at the work to make sure. But as journalists, I, you know, we, we shouldn't do that. I think we should be sensitive to it. Um, I think, um, you know, uh, there used to be, uh, and I, I even said this one time that, you know, every Black Lives Matter protest should not be covered by all black people though, right? Um, <laughs> but some of them can be if they happen to be, you know, if it happens to be where our black correspondents are or they should be part of, you know, the coverage to help us inform the coverage, you know, I would ask this, here's another place to go in this community, this might be a better way to uh, interact or engage or talk to people. I think all of that is important. And I don't believe in putting us in a, a box anymore. I do, however, you know, I, I don't agree with people actually participating in these events and then covering them. I think that's a line that we should not cross. Anyone else want to weigh in on this? I, I, I'll, I'll add, I, I, I think the, I think the uh, arguments against objectivity 
sometimes are setting up a straw man and then shooting down a straw man. Mm -hmm. You know, I've never had an editor who said to me, be, you know, be equivocate on everything, give everybody absolutely equal say, uh, you know, and don't have judgment. I mean, being a journalist, being an editor involves judgment. What goes in the story, what you write, how you edit it. I mean, those are choices. I don't think anybody should be naive about that. But it's really about what are we doing as news journalists? What are we doing as news journalists? It's not true in every in every kind of journalism. But you know, if you're a news journalist, you're striving to be as truthful as you can be. You're striving to be as fair as you can be. You're striving to get voices in the right way. You're, 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 you're curious. You should be humble because there's always another call to make. There's always another person to talk to. You, you don't know everything. And you should be self-aware enough to know where your own you know, biases or weaknesses lie, and at least be willing to challenge yourself wherever you come from. I think those are good journalistic practices. And I, and I think if you have a newsroom where people can do that, then you're actually doing, journalism is an activity that's every bit as important as some of the other kinds of activities because you're standing up for what we do is try to tell truth, try to serve people, try to get to the heart of the matter, Sometimes I have to remind our folks, because I, you know, I, I, I have a similar view to Kim about marches and protests and outside involvement on a personal level. Sometimes I have to remind people, we've chosen to be in a profession that contributes to society in a really important way for that reason. But people, people have to feel that you're basically fair. That's the issue. They don't have to feel, but nobody, and you have to be honest, nobody believes that everybody's, you know, totally objective. So I think having a newsroom and a, and a structure where you can talk about these things, share thoughts, compare notes, find a way, I think that's a really healthy part of it. And I think some of the examples that are in your question, you know, Emily, I probably won't say which ones, I think were bad decisions. I disagree with the calls that were made. So, but I think what you need is a process to talk about it, a basically shared commitment to what you're doing. And, 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 and a system in which people feel heard, talk things through, because really journalists want to do the same things. We want to bear witness to truth. We want to serve people by bringing that. That's what I think. You know, the, the, the only thing I would add, um, I did like Kim's perspective on shared life experiences is that, you know, our, our business should evolve. I mean, you know, I don't know why every other business has evolved. I mean, our uh, our profession is evolving and and should continue to evolve, you know. And and new people are coming into it, and so uh, I've I've never been a fan of the word objective. To be honest, um, I was taught it in, in journalism school. I didn't didn't have the fortune of going to Medill that some of the people on here, but I, I was taught about objectivity. I just don't think it's a really apt word, you know. And we're in the business of language, you know. Our our profession is so complex. You know, there's so many different entry points to stories, ways to frame stories. So in, in some ways, objectivity is not really the right word. You know, um, we have some practices, right? We we fact check, right? We we bounce off we uh, some assumptions and suppositions and go find out if the facts follow them. But, but we have to be honest, we, we have a lot of subjectivity because we're a product. And this goes back to the first question, Emily, about diversity. We're, we're a product of, of who we are as a news organization. Who do you have in your newsroom making decisions, covering stories? Uh, we have lots of filters, lots of balances, checks and balances. Uh, we can run stories off people with different points of view. But that's where you get to diversity, you know, diversity of interests, diversity of life experiences. Uh, diversity of perspective, uh, geographical diversity, uh, you know, age, gender, all kinds of diversity. And, and, and the better newsroom we build, the better our work's going to be. Well, Kevin, that was a great setup for my next question, which actually is on a different kind of diversity, and that's ideological diversity um, in American newsrooms. I mean, to be candid, I can count on one hand probably the number of openly conservative journalists I've worked with in regional, state, and national newsrooms. Um, and among those, I'd say I'd be hard pressed to find a Trump voter or anyone who might have like questioned the outcome of the 2020 election. Last August, the Pew Research Center released a survey showing that only 35% of Republicans have some trust in national news outlets. That number was 70% in 2016. How do we honor our commitment to truth and to facts while also challenging allegations of media bias when many of our newsrooms generally reflect one political persuasion? And Melissa, I'm gonna tag you to tackle that hard one. 
Um, thank you. Uh, I actually was like so excited about the objectivity question. So I'm going to like tie them two together, <laughs> tie the two together. Um, and I think that they're, I think that they are tied together. I think that, that people and audiences have lost uh, confidence in news organizations because of this confusion around objectivity. Um, and I do think it is a semantics issue. I do think that we've gotten kind of like tied up in what is objective um, about journalism. One thing that I think really strongly is that it's actually something that we should be incredibly proud of as news organizations that we use editorial judgment, that we pay smart, thoughtful, interested editors <laughs> to make choices. And we should say that loudly. It's something that I think about right now when I'm looking at Spotify and Joe Rogan and Facebook, I'm sorry, Meta and their uh, approach to curation. We should say that one of the values of, of uh, being an audience member of a news organization is that we are trying to help make choices to curate, to provide the best information possible for our audiences. Um, and, and that does require us making choices. Um, and so I think that the way that this ties into the ideological question, Emily, and also the overall question about needing to be smart about what we're offering to our audiences is thinking about the relationship that you have with your audience. What are you admitting to them? What are you telling them that you are providing for them? What are the values that you're, that you're arriving at? Um, in the moment of the start of the relationship. Who are you as a brand? What do you represent? And that really is, I think, a human relationship. Um, you should bring your full self to work. You should bring your, the brand itself, the news organization should bring their, their proposition to the table. And then the audience can choose whether or not they want to participate in that, uh, participate with them in that. Um, one of the examples that I love to um, provide is we have an incredible health reporter named Julia Blues who uh, did a, um, a, a deep investigation on teenage gastric bypass surgery. And she admitted in the first paragraph that she did not think it was a good idea when she started reporting the story. That's a very different change from how we've reported the news in the past, where we, where we did enter the story as if we weren't bringing judgment to the story itself. But it brings the audience along with her as she discovers and confronts her own biases with that. I'm, I'm referring to something that's in the healthcare world instead of the political world, because I think that it can apply to anything. Uh, a sports journalist will have a favorite team. I'm sorry if you don't want to admit it, but you will. <laughs> um, a TV critic will have a favorite TV show. Um, and I think that that enriches our reporting and doesn't detract from it. But we do have to build that trusting relationship by saying who we are up front um, and walking into that relationship with eyes wide open. And then we should be proud of that and, and say that that is what we offer. That's something different that we offer to our audiences. Matt, how do you think about this? Oh, wait, I'm about to, I, Kim is really good at coming off uh, mic and showing me. Kim, jump in, good. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I was trying to keep it conversational, right? Good, good job. Uh, not that I'm trying to, um, I just had some, some thoughts about it in a different way. Um, um, I agree with Melissa on a lot of that. Like again, bringing your, your authentic self to your reporting, right? Um, but, but another way, um, because it is, hard to figure out, you know, I'm going to hire more conservative reporters or all of that. I think our bigger obligation is to the citizens of the country, the citizens that we serve. And that's where we have to commit to engaging with all of the country. And um, that's where I see opportunity for us, frankly, you know, you have big stations and networks on the East Coast and the West Coast and, you know, um, Chicago, you know, all that, but like the middle of the country. Um, we need to get into those communities and actually live there and actually get to know people and actually try to understand people and that will inform our reporting. So I think, you know, for us, that's what I'm concentrating on as we, especially during this election year, look at that, you know, and we've been burned before because we haven't done enough of that is getting at ways to do that. We're committing to putting reporters in the middle of the country to live there, to have reporters drive back and forth, to really become part of the communities and try to understand and ask the right questions so that we can get at the answers that all of us need to hear. And I think, you know, when you talk about conservatives or Republicans, 
not having much faith in media. Well, you know, there, there have been years of we're enemies of the people and, you know, all of that. I think really the pandemic has helped us though in that way because America needed information. And once again, we showed our value by providing it. Even then it was an opportunity for us to become more diverse in our reporting. Um, I'll never forget, I remember sitting at the time I was at CBS News and looking at the pictures of people standing outside hospitals in New York City, and I grew up in New York City, and I was like, wait a minute, I, I know that neighborhood, and I know that neighborhood, and I could see for myself, this is hurting more people of color, like that's a Black neighborhood, and that's a Spanish neighborhood, and look at the faces on those lines, and like that's how we were able to get ahead of the story, is because I could see that, you know, so anyway, it's, it's, it's all about committing to the citizens that we serve and understanding that we really are trying to serve the entire country and committing to that. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, Matt, I'm curious how you feel about that coming from a newsroom that probably has the most comfort uh, among conservatives. Yeah, I don't know, I, I guess. Look, I don't think about it. In, I don't, I get, to be honest, I don't think about it in quite the way you framed it in this sense. I mean, look, broadly, look, if you look broadly at the surveys and the voting, as you say, newsrooms are overwhelmingly representing one point of view. I don't know how exactly I would set about getting more Republicans so-called. I don't ask people who they voted for. I don't ask people their political views. I don't believe that it's my right to know. And what I have said to people, even at various occasions, I don't care what your views are. When you come here, you've got to do your best to you know, be as straight as you can be. So I think the challenge that we do have, I would frame it in this, in this sense, part of diversity has to be experiential diversity and that it can include politics. I don't see everything through a politics lens. It's a very, very politicized time in the country. So, but I, I don't necessarily see party affiliation as the most important thing you think about, but experiential diversity is a challenge in the industry on top of racial diversity and gender diversity. You know, journalists, broadly speaking, in many cases, at least at an institution like ours, you know, uh, are not economically diverse in all of their backgrounds or even as geographically diverse as they used to be. And I think that the challenge where I think it hurts us in journalism is less sort of in like, who's there to speak up to say that Trump won the election? Because, you know, facts are facts. You have to be in the fact business. You're not looking for false information. But who there can explain why some people vote for him despite misgivings or feelings or what's behind that or who could speak to that or who brings some of the framing at least into informing the stories. And in my sense, that's of a piece with the other kinds of diversity that we've talked about already tonight, which is, at least for us, it's, I mean, you know, I, I will say that, you know, what I think Melissa said, I just want to go back there. I think, I think a lot matters in how you behave on what's the proposition you're putting forth. And, you know, what are you saying? If you have, if you have, if you have a take, just say it. The problem that we run into in journalism is if we claim we don't have a take, but we do, at least in news journalism. So, you know, look, I, that's probably a mushy answer, Emily, but I, I think it's, I think, I think, it's part of thinking about who's in the room and talking and what they're sharing and having a, an, an environment where people feel comfortable to do that. I think I do believe in the same way I believe in other, uh, all kinds of diversity that you're gonna get better stories if you have those better conversations. And I do think in general, some of the views have, those views have probably been missing in some conversations the last uh, few years. So, I, so. You know, the, on, the only thing I'd add is that where it may be most pronounced is in the opinion pages, right? When you have people who have a really a defined body of work that comes from either a liberal ideology or a particular uh, ideology that people can see. And so you wanna have your mix of commentary. But I think I, I'm with Matt on the day-to-day -day journalism, one of the things I think we do too often, right? And this is where my nuance comes to the question is that uh, we're all the product of, uh, we all have multiple identities. You know, we're not one thing. I, I, you know, as a black man, I don't want to be defined and, and have an assumption placed on me of what it is to be black, right? Because that's, that's a, you know, people have lots of different ways to be black or, or gay or, or Latino or a woman, uh, and they, they, they may fuse different identities. And so I think when you come into journalism, 
you're bringing your entire self. Sometimes you bring a part of your identity to the consideration of stories, and sometimes you bring another part of your identity. And, and we, we do a lot of presumption when it comes to box and particularly around the big identities that we, we uh, often the public sometimes expects us to organize around. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, all right, I'm gonna pivot to a, a conversation about social media here and we have a couple slides and Kevin, I'll start with you this time around so you can prepare yourself. Uh, so, so many of these debates play out on social media, which journalists and newsrooms have a profound love-hate relationship with. Uh, according to the Medill survey, more than 86% of respondents said that social media companies have too much control over the mix of news people see. Uh, nearly 91% said the role social media companies play in delivering the news results in a worse mix of news. Uh, and 80% said social media has had a mostly negative impact on our industry, contributing to both inaccurate news and one-sided news. Uh, if all of this is true, how have we, as in theory, the arbiters of truth, uh, ceded so much ground to these platforms, to these social media companies? How do we begin to get that back or, or has the ship sailed for good? And you know, if we know it's bad for us, why do so many journalists spend so much time there? Uh, Kevin, I'll, uh, I'll let you oh. begin. Yeah, it's as you said. There's there's certainly a lot of, of frustration, and and hey, there there are legislation in various places. You know, make make the social make the the technology companies own you know the the responsibility part of of being media organizations. But but I think we also have to control what we can control. I mean, we're not putting the genie back in in the in the bottle, so to speak. Uh, a lot of the same customers right the the people that we seek to reach with our work the people we want to subscribe you know those who have subscription business to our work um are the same people uh spending time on social media it's a gateway to our work and so we have to be we have to operate on it you know and and we also that's the other part of social we have to operate on it and use the platforms i want to separate the platforms as they exist as means of communication and building communities from the companies themselves as as competitors, right? In some ways, and so I I think the platforms are to our advantage actually, uh, and 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 within the platforms um, we have the ability to also to to hop in and define our relationship. You know how we're going to access them, how we're going to communicate through them. You know I do think we have a broader question of media literacy right and and how do we convey truth and establish truth and, and because some some facts are just facts there there are lots of things we can debate and and have different perspectives but there are some some facts that are unchallenged and 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 somehow the fact checker uh, organization. I helped to cre create the fact check and think of the Washington Post and, and help to, 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 uh, to build it there. There are lots of other kinds of fact checking and it still hasn't penetrated. And so somehow we do have to, I think that's where we, we need more unification among media to see that, that these are attacks to our profession when, when people can deliberately and consciously uh, mislead. Anyone else want to jump in there, Matt? I, yes. want to, I want to add one thing. Well, I hope it's not an off point because uh, it's a little bit of a slightly different thing with Kevin, although I agree with what Kevin said. But look, since this is Medill, and so since we have, I presume, a lot of students on the line, as just one thing I would say, social media is a tool from a journalist perspective to be used. It's a tool to get news out there. In most cases, for the reporters out there, not reporting on social media, but taking your camera or your notebook or your pen and pad and going out and talking to real people and not mistaking the dialogue on social media for real life is the way to go. And I think one way social media has to some extent hurt us is by de defining the things in its terms and then those become the stories that we cover. But actually what's really happening in the world is much richer, fuller, and more varied and, and dramatic than what is reflected on social media. I mean, we know from the data, for instance, at Twitter, and to your question about why are we on it, because it's engineered to make us addictive. That's why everybody's on it. But that's what it does. That's why it's a successful product. But we know from the data that the people who are dominating on Twitter are not necessarily broadly representative of society. So shame on us for getting too sucked in sometimes to what happens on Twitter in real life 
any reporter who, and so that's the way I think social media has damaged reporting. Any reporter who can break away from that and go report and find your sources, your people, your stories, your ways of getting out there, you're going to have an advantage. I really think that's true because I think one of the challenges, we, we see this on social media, we've had fewer journalism jobs, we have fewer outlets, and yet sometimes magically somebody some, says something on social media and you could read the same story in 12 outlets. Well, that's not, you know, go find your own path on reporting and use it as a tool, but don't be overly dependent. I really like that, Matt. Um, and Kevin, just exclamation point on the media literacy part of, of it. Um, and I don't know, quite know how we get back at that, but teaching people how to become smart consumers of news um, and, you know, following their own sources, uh, you know, looking at two or three different outlets so you're not in an echo chamber. And I think, uh, you know, we've got to figure out how we do that with younger people. Whenever I go talk to high schoolers or, you know, kids who are in junior high, I start talking about that because they do get sucked. And once you become a consumer of one thing, they know how to get you. They keep sending you misinformation or whatever it is they think you believe. And you have to be able to get yourself out of that and look at and choose you know I, I always push whatever outlet i work for right watch abc but don't just watch abc watch and read i always say find a newspaper or two a national one a local one that you also and once you watch this and read that and read that there will be some collective truth that will help inform you that you go you know what this is the fact here everybody sort of agrees around this i may or may not agree but but you know being smarter consumers i think is really important and i, I don't know exactly how we do that maybe there's a campaign or something but we should we should do that and just social media we have to engage with audiences wherever they are i mean that that's just a fact of life right now we have to engage wherever they are so you know we just have to find ways to to break through the clutter so that they get at the truth. Uh, all right, well, I'm gonna pivot uh, to talking about the pandemic and we have a couple of slides here that we can bring up. Um, so obviously the pandemic has moved beyond uh, a handful of news cycles to our new normal, uh, and at least for now, our foreseeable future. 55% of poll respondents said their daily workload has increased during the pandemic, which is obviously not sustainable for the long haul. It's why burnout has been such a central conversation in so many US newsrooms of late. Uh, and nearly 70% of respondents said they're still working most remotely. Uh, I want to know how the pandemic has changed your newsrooms, sort of is this a forever change, you know, and kind of what are the costs and benefits of, of remote work? Melissa, I would love to uh, talk to you, start with you as the one in the room who uh, procreated over the course of a pandemic. <laughs> so why don't you kick us off a little bit? Sure. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think I think remote, the the idea of remote work is is obscuring really what's happening. We were a remote company before the pandemic. Vox Media was founded with the idea of having uh, folks um, across the country that could work anywhere they were at. Uh, it's We know the benefits of a remote culture. Talent is in St. Louis and Seattle and New York and DC. Um, but what we experienced over the last couple of years wasn't just a remote workplace. It was, it was a workplace that was struck with true tragedy. It's it's parents at home trying to deal with children that have un, uncertain childcare. It's um, the loneliness that has in, impacted uh, elderly um, people. It's the um, reality of us all facing he true healthcare concerns. Um, there's real trauma that our employees are experiencing and that that's not a result of being a remote workplace. That's a result of being in a, in a serious global crisis. Um, and I think that the thing that I really want us to consider and to, and to remember about this time is um, how important it is to recognize that we need to create a space and a support system for our employees, whether they are having just an average bad day or a truly horrible moment in their lives. Um, how are we thinking about um, better uh, bereavement leave? How are we thinking about uh, understanding the difficulty of um, being a new parent and returning to work. Um, how are we thinking about uh, uh, the uh, the impact of losing you know, more women from uh, the workplace um, when there are moments of crisis? 
Uh, and, um, and so, so the term remote feels to me almost like it's missing the larger story, which is, which is, which has been a much more horrible, tragic story for most people. Kim, I can't tell if you're in a newsroom or in a really awesome kitchen one way or the other. <laughs> tell me a little bit about your, about sort of remote work for you. And, and do you have folks back in newsrooms? What's the environment like for you? Okay. Um, I am in my office and I'm the only one in, in the building right now. Um, <laughs> that's what the new normal is. Um, most of the time, when I first got here, because I started here during a pandemic, right, I did come into the office, but literally there were four people. And then the people who actually have to be in control rooms when we're putting shows on, they have to come in. But it's, I, I think for the foreseeable future, I, I don't know a time when we're going to go back to the way it was. I, I look outside my office and there are hundreds of seats out in that newsroom. I don't think that's ever going, they are ever going to be filled again, um, a sitting, you know, cubicle to cubicle, you know, that kind of thing. Um, however, um, and we've talked about this, like I've stopped, we've stopped at Disney putting dates on when we're, we're going to come back. We are, you know, it's going to be some sort of hybrid future because to Melissa's point, life has just changed for all of us and everybody there. And we have to embrace that. Um, and we found that even with 90% of our employees at home, we're still putting news shows on the air that um, are still serving the public in the way that we did beforehand. But here's what I worry about and what we're talking about. I worry that all of us who went home before, you know, for the, when the pandemic happened, went home with a certain skill set. And that's why it's working because we already know what we're doing. And so I worry about the uh, the creative ricochet that's lost in newsrooms when everybody is sitting in a, you know, in their living rooms, et cetera. We're not in rooms where people, we just engage and talk and figure out things. And, you know, Zoom is just different in that way. I worry about that. And I worry about the next generation of journalists, right? So people coming out of journalism schools right now who start in their living room there is something missing. So much is done in the creative process and the storytelling process in edit bays, um, on the, you know, as you're out on stories. Um, as a journalist too, I feel like it's hard to be a good journalist if all you do is sit in your living room all day. You're not engaging with people, how other Americans are living, the fact that they have to get on subways and buses and walk down streets and go to stores, you know, you just become too boxed in. Like part of our, um, you know, I think part of our charge is to cover, you know, cover stories and be part of communities and understand what's going on. And some of that is lost. I really worry about us not teaching the next generation the right way. You know, everything is in a square box and, you know, it's just not enough. So I, I see us coming back in some sort of hybrid fashion, because I do want, even if it's 25% of people in the building at a time and 75% at home or certain meetings, you know, when it's safe to do that again, that we bring in groups at a time to talk about our creative process and what we might want to do and how we want to cover that election and what I found out today. Like, I think it's, it's going to have to be some mixture of that um, I don't think we're ever coming back and everybody's just coming to work again, nine to five or whatever shift they have. I think we're going to have to be flexible. Well, uh, we're here this evening marking the centennial and the legacy of the Medill School at Northwestern University. Um, I'm a Medill alumna. Melissa and Matt are also graduates. Um, but I'd really like for all of you, you know, we've got about 10 minutes left here before we open to Q&A. And I'd love for all of you just to talk about how your college experiences shaped your careers. And maybe as a part B, you know, for the students who are participating in this evening's event, what should they be doing now to prepare themselves for a future in journalism? And Matt, maybe we'll start with you. I'm probably the worst because when I get asked about my college experience, what I say is it taught me how much I didn't know. And uh, I came in thinking I knew a lot and I came out thinking I didn't know a lot. And part of the reason that I ended up liking journalism was because I realized I need to keep learning and keep finding things out and keep exploring things and keep understanding the world. So 
I had a fantastic time in Northwestern and Medill. I made lifelong friends. I learned a lot. And of course I have that same feeling. Sometimes I wish I could go do it again because now I really make the most of it. Look, I think the, the, if you want to be a great journalist, uh, then I think use everything the university can give you in every way possible to broaden yourself. Don't stick just to, no, sorry, Charles, uh, to say this. Don't stick to journalism classes alone, but learn economics, learn history. We've talked a lot tonight about diversity and a college campus is a pretty good place to find different groups of people to meet and understand and get to know. And, and take, take time now as you are studying and going about your college life to be, I think, a you know, broad, experienced, empathetic, curious person and, and develop skills and knowledge in lots of areas because journalism you know, is one of the best ways to have a lifelong journey of learning and experiencing and trying new things. So cultivate the habits now, I would say. I mean, on a practical level, of course, flexibility, lots of skills, you know, knowing everything these days, making your opportunities and, you know, all the stuff that you hear from your professors. But I think, I think it's just the best atmosphere to, to develop and cultivate the habits that are going to help you in journalism the rest of your life. Thanks, Matt. Kevin, what about you? You know, I'd, I'd say to the students, like lean, it was an exhilarating time for me and it was a challenging time. I, I mean, I went to Boston University and I went in to school after Watergate, uh, that whole period where journalism schools were, were uh, booming. And so it was a exciting time for a profession. I also was in Boston during one of the most racially tense times uh, in the history of that city, right after busing there. And, and, and it was a very tense time. Uh, and Boston University is right in the heart of a city on the street. And so uh, there were a lot of challenges. I, I got an internship at the Boston Globe, which was fantastic. And we also started a, a black student newspaper on, on campus, which was something that had not existed. And so all of these kind of experience combined to really, they, they were life forming for me. You know, they set the course of how I thought about the profession going into it over years and things come full circle, I ended up you know, going to ESPN to, to start The Undefeated. And I, I thought a lot about that experience of what it was like to start, have a, have a startup of a different kind uh, at Boston University and we started a black student newspaper. So um, the, the main thing I think about college for students here is just take every, you know, soak up every drop of it, you know, and, and really just put your arms around it, you know, and, and, and really, the people that are there, the professors, the experience, and just enjoy that and, and learn from it. Great. Kim, oh, Melissa, you're on my, either one of you, jump in, back to back. Melissa, you go. <laughs> no, Kim, you go this time. I, I let you go. I, I jumped in first. Go ahead. Uh, I, I'm just going to read you over here and, and show something. This right here is a 1980 Greyhound bus, and I keep it on my desk. Um, because that's how I got to college uh, in 1980. Somebody gave me the, a replica of this Greyhound bus. And I, I went from New York City to Tallahassee, Florida, Florida A&M University, um, 30 hours on a bus to get to a college. And I, I want to remind myself of, you know, my roots, like what I've uh, done, um, you know, from the time that I started there to, to here and, and stay humble about that. Um, but I think the first thing you have to do in college is decide if this is what you really want to do, if you're passionate about it, because the work is hard um, in that you have to invest yourself, your time, your, your, your brain, you know, who you are. Like, it takes a lot to be a great journalist. You know, you have to really love it. Um, you know, things happen, you've got to run, you've got to go, you've got to leave your family, like it, it, it takes a lot. Um, and I always say, if you're not passionate about it, you're going to be found out really easily. <laughs> like, you know, in a newsroom, you will stick out. So you really should decide. Uh, and you do that by, you know, going out and trying to, to get involved in the business while you're in college, you know, 
work for the radio station, work for the, the college newspaper. And I know Medill has, you know, all of these opportunities, but you really have to try it and get in it and see where you fit in too. That's the other thing, you know, you may be better at this and not at that, um, you know, um, uh, camera work is journalism, you know, photojournalism is a thing. Are you, is that where you belong? I think you, you really have to try things and see, I, I didn't know what a producer was when I first started. And that's what I realized I'm really good at. Um, but it took some, you know, piddling around and trying to figure it out. And like, this is where I belong and this is how I'm going to, uh, to ascend. So I would say that. And one other thing, while you're in college, challenge yourself to cover a story or, or yeah, cover a story that makes you feel uncomfortable, something you don't know about, something that, you know, it's easy in the college newsroom, right? They go, who wants to cover the football game? Oh, me, who wants to do this? You know, you, you, you can choose the things that make you comfortable, find the story or that you don't know anything about, that you're going to have to do some homework, that, you know, you're just that that you don't know and you just need to make yourself sort of do those things because that will also challenge your journalism skills and your love for the profession. When you're doing everything, covering all the stories that you like, you know, then that's easier. But you, and, and also to, to diversity and all of that, you know, diversity of thought, diversity of communities, make yourself go cover some things that make you a little uncomfortable so that you figure out how to cover those things. Melissa Bell, who probably never got a Medill F. Jump in. <laughs> Actually, you'd be surprised. Uh, <laughs> um, the, I think the thing that like is a common theme through all of this is that, you know, the thing that I love about journalism is that we actually get paid to be curious. Uh, it is a job where you get to ask questions for a living. Um, and and um, school is a place where you can do that with huge amounts of resources um, available to you experts on campus, other people who um, come from various places on Greyhound buses that you may never have met before. I mean, really, it's a it's an incredible opportunity to explore your curiosities. Um, just to be contrarian, though, I will say that there is also an opportunity where you don't have to go to school if you cannot. I don't I want to also speak to the non students on this on this call that I think that I, it was a gift that I got to go to school. I was very lucky that I was able to attend the school because it, it helped me um, fast forward my entry into journalism. I had no background. I had, I had no, but I didn't know anyone who was in journalism and, um, and, and Northwestern helped me find my connection to the work. Um, but there are ways to do that, um, now without having to go to school as well. Um, it's just the fastest probably route that I found, um, and the one with the most opportunities, but the most important thing and the thing that I loved about Medill was that it allowed you to do the work. It allowed you to go out on the street, to interview the person, to put yourself in the uncomfortable position. Um, and that was for me invaluable, even with my C in copy editing. So. <laughs> Honestly, thank you. All right, well, we're gonna turn it over to audience Q&A now. So please um, submit your questions. And I'm gonna start with one uh, here that we just got that's great. Um, I spent 25 years, this is not me. I, I spent 25 years in newsrooms across the country, 18 years of those at ABC in Chicago. Uh, in my tenure in the business, I've seen TV newsrooms, local at least, getting away from telling stories that really impact people. Time and resources are given less to people who wanna tell great stories and instead to chase one-off stories like fires and shootings. How do we get back to the days of true storytelling in local news instead of the flashy lead, which could I think be part of a broader conversation around um, the challenges facing local news in general in this country? Um, who would like to jump in there? Kim or Kevin, both of you with great histories in local news? Yeah, maybe Kevin, you go first this time. I feel like I'm talking too much. <laughs> no, I, I think that was aimed at fastball straight at you, Kim, you know. <laughs> uh, listen, uh, you know, ABC, it is a challenge, right? It really is um, a challenge. But I think, again, um, in the last couple of years, if, if it bears redemption, you know, I really do feel like covering this pandemic and the way the world has changed has um, helped newsrooms to become more empathetic uh, to communities and tell better stories. Uh, I, I really do. I think, you know, in the middle of all of this, 
um, we, um, to your point, Melissa, you know, we were in the middle of it too, losing people, afraid, scared to get in, in a taxi or ride a subway, like all of those fears about everything that matters to man, really, you know, from our health to, to money, um, you know, all of the education of our children, how are we going to do it, family dynamics, so we, you know, we, we were in the middle of it. And I think that we have become a little bit better at that. Um, there was a time, in, especially in local news. Um, and the other thing is we need to talk about it more. So you know, to the person who asked the question, I would try to engage your newsroom management in having discussions about that, about your concern about it, um, uh, about you know, our, um, why are we really here? Is it to you know, talk about every robbery and you know, bad thing happening, or is it to try to help people um, by giving them information that they can use, that they can um, uh, help us to inform, that they can, you know, uh, relate to, um, that's relevant to their lives? Um, you know, is that why we're here? I, I think it's time to try to engage in those conversations and just ask for them. A lot of times, you know, we, we sit in a corner and we talk among ourselves, well, why are we doing that? Well, and management wants to hear that. And even if they don't, you have a right to, to raise those questions. And if you don't do it, you know, by yourself, if you're afraid, like get a group of friends and say, can we have a, a, a talk in the newsroom about how we're covering things and what we're covering? Because uh, I have some ideas that I think we should do. Thanks, Kim. That's great. Okay, now I've got a good one for the editors in chief in the room. This is clearly a reporter's question. What are some suggestions for best practices when you just disagree with your editor on the story angle, or you want to bring more diversity of opinions to a story than your editor wants? Well, Kevin? look, the, the first thing is don't don't come to me, you know. <laughs> uh, no, I, I do think that um, we have to have open discussions and you know, I, I think when when you have different angles, I think one of the strategies is is to to present the alternative. You know, to if if you uh, are trying to uh, argue for a story, I, I I think you have to have a newsroom culture that that uh, embraces that. First of all, that that I try to make a newsroom that's not hierarchical. You know, I I I'm accessible. I like to have open discussions, more transparency to talk openly about our successes and failures. But I think uh, from a reporter to editor standpoint, I think it's always been, you know, trying to find, okay, here's, listen to the way a story, what, what an editor may have to say, but bring some alternative suggestions. I'll add that I think what, what Kevin said about trying to cultivate a newsroom where people feel comfortable doing that is important, but I will say it's harder for us, it's harder sometimes than I'd like it to be. So I've had many, I had some real instances where reporters think something, but then they come and talk to me and actually the conversation we'll have is different than they thought. One of the, one of the fun things about like, I discovered at one point after I'd been editor for a while that at some point the word got out of the newsroom that I never wanted to show photos of red cars. Now, I don't said, think I ever said that, but I have no idea how that became gospel wisdom. And so one of the challenges that's behind that is newsrooms often run on rumor and speculation and theories. And really, you're a reporter. Go report. Go talk to the person. Go raise the question. If you've heard something, go ask. That's important, too. Stand up for yourself. All right, here's a good one for you, Melissa, about reaching younger audience uh, on audiences. Um, the question is, it seems like most students get their news from social media, reading just the headlines. How can we stimulate young people to read more in-depth news so they can learn more about what's going on than what they might see just in a tweet or in a headline? Um, I would probably argue that there's some research that shows that a lot of people are getting their news from social media, not just young people. Um, I think that that's something that was evident that um, that actually older generations were getting much of their news from Facebook um, over the last couple of years. So I think that this is important not to d discard the, the question, just that it is important for us to recognize how much of an impact uh, social media has had on, on our reporting. And I think that this is where we need to understand social media platforms in a, in a very different way. And we're in this 
funny moment where I think when we were talking about social media usage, it, it's, it strikes me how we have this brand new technology. It's sure it's 10 years old at this point or 15 years old at this point, but that's pretty new in the terms of a, of a new medium. And we're just understanding both like the strengths and the weaknesses of it. Um, we talked about some of the weaknesses of it, but we, you know, there are strengths in it. There are ways to reach people that you couldn't reach before. There's ways to get collective energy around a subject um, that you couldn't before. Um, and, and so I think that it's important for us to, to see what is valuable, valuable about them. So I think that in terms of like reaching young people on social media that just see the headline, I think that it's on us a little bit to say, how do we write headlines in a way not to, not to trick people or not to minimize the subject, but how do we really think about our headline as a, as a standalone unit of information that goes out there and reaches people and engages them enough to reach read deeper into the subject matter? How are we using that tool with both its strengths and its weaknesses to, to capture that audience and lead them further into the subject matter? I think that is where our role as um, experts, uh, as much as we can be experts of a very new medium, um, uh, come into play. Uh, and so, you know, this is where I think that the importance of social media editors in newsroom, um, th their rise has, is really important. We should need to listen to the people who know these platforms well, um, so that we can change our work. Um, what a headline that worked in a newspaper or a headline that works on a lower third of a television will not work on a, on a tweet. The context is very different. Um, so that's, that's the way that I think about it is what's our role in shaping, um, that experience for our reader. Great. Kim, could you add to that? How, how are you all thinking about this, uh, in terms of your audiences, in terms of reaching younger audiences? Now see that time I didn't unmute. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I think, uh, for us, the opportunity lies in streaming. Um, because on linear television, audiences are just getting older, right? I think the average age now of a news viewer is, is somewhere between 61 and 65. For ABC News, it's 64. Um, and, uh, you know, on the streaming side of it, it's 30 years younger, right? So, and you look at all your AVOD platforms, so, you know, everything, Roku, Pluto, you know, all of those things. And then, you know, your SVOD where you have to pay and I'll just say Hulu, Disney Plus, um, things like that. Um, but that's an opportunity for us. Like, again, this speaks to meeting audiences where they are. And Melissa, you're right. I think the, la the last uh, survey that I saw, 52% of adults get their news first on digital. Like it comes on their phone, you know? Um, and then if you look at 18 to 34 year olds, I saw a poll that said, I think the majority, like 34% of them get all of their news on streaming or digital and don't look at linear at all. You know, my 24 and 27 year old daughters are among those people. Like they don't watch TV. They project their phone onto the wall. I'm not kidding. Um, so like that, you have to engage with them where they are. And so you, you've seen it, CNN Plus, you know, CNN Plus, Peacock, um, Paramount Plus, they're all, we're all in this, you know, ramp up mode right now um, to expand the newsrooms on the digital and streaming side. We're hiring many more people over there um, to engage with these audiences. Now, the quality of ABC News, ABC News Live is our streaming channel. Um, we're investing that, that's where we invested most of our people this year. Um, and we will ramp up the linear, uh, like we have, uh, we're, we're going to hire some people on linear, but that, that is also to service both now. It's like, you're no longer just servicing, you know, ABC, the network, you're servicing all of our streaming and digital channels as well. We are ramping up people over there, you know, so that's what we're doing is, is looking at where the audiences are and where they're growing. And we want ABC News to be where they are. So we're ramping up the reporting avenues uh, there. Wonderful. Well, we are out of time this evening. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you so much to Melissa, to Matt, uh, to Kim, to the whole crew. Kevin, I didn't forget you. Uh, thank you all so much for being with us this evening. And I'm going to turn it back over to the Medill folks. I believe there's a, a parting video here. Medill's past is unparalleled. 
For 100 years, Medill has trained the world's best storytellers, whether they are journalists who record the first draft of history or marketers blending data with creativity. Medill students and alumni craft the narratives of the events, people, and brands that populate and animate our world. Medill's future is as bright and limitless as our imaginations. Cheers to 100 years. Thank you.